Hi, and welcome back to Brentwood Stories. The next guest for our Brentwood Bio series is homegrown artist Diego Garcia. Diego's art has been featured in exhibitions across Long Island and New York City, and in today's episode, I was blessed with the privilege of learning more about Diego's arts, his roots in Brentwood, and his early influences and inspirations. Enjoy. What's going on, everybody who's checking in out there? My name is Diego Garcia. I'm a 28-year-old painter from Long Island, New York, specifically Brentwood. I started school in Brentwood. Uh, I went to North Side, you know, North Middle, North Elementary, Sonderling High School, and I spent my entire youth in Brentwood. So Brentwood is very near and dear to my heart. Anything for Brentwood, anything for the North Side, forever. I'm very blessed to have the upbringing from there, from that, from that time, from that place. So yeah, all that to say, yeah, that's my ties. I, I'm in a one essence or form. I think everybody who's from Brentwood feels like they are Brentwood to some extent. And I feel that way dearly. So, well, that that was actually one of my first questions: is uh, if you, if you went to any of the schools around here. So you were a uh, Sonderling grad. Yeah, yeah, class of 2010, class of 2010, class clown of my <laughs> year, I might add. So anybody who wants to do the homework someday, check it in on this. You know. Well, we have the yearbooks here, so I can actually go and check yeah, and look you this can up. Yeah, actually pull that up, huh? Just to jump right into just a little bit about your connection with Brentwood and your history here. Um, did you have any teachers over at the high school that were influential as to, to what you do now? Oh, absolutely. There's so many of them. There was a, I took Regents Chemistry with Mr. Giannakos, and he was a, such a great mentor to me because he kind of like knew I was like this artsy kid that was out of touch with a lot of things that were going on primarily in those late years of high school, right? Those That's college prep. That's finding yourself, whatever else kind of comes with the, the timeline of high school, right? And he kind of always noticed I was out of touch with those things. So he'd always just put me on a art and stuff and music that we would kind of find a common ground on. And it kept me kind of driven in, in class enough because I liked chemistry. I liked that stuff. And, and uh, uh, Mr. Rotella, who was right next door to him teaching chemistry as well, uh, I had in 10th grade, I had Miss Ambrosio. She got married. I forget her new name now. We keep in touch. But she introduced me to this awesome creative writing exercise, this free writing exercise in English class that I still use to this day, that I still practice to this day. And it's actually translated very well into my artistic process using poetry, lyrics, little handwritten stanzas in my work that kind of help the viewer digest my message. I got that all at Brentwood. And then the art department itself, anybody from Brentwood will know that little wing in the middle of DPH or whatever is kind of where it was a safe space for creatives and Miss Grassi, Miss Franz, all those other teachers. I still keep in touch with Miss Franz. She's no longer at the district, but oh man, like that was home for me. You know, that was like a safe space where I could kind of, you know, pick apart ideas and I could get critiques and feedback. And I wouldn't be who I am if I grew up anywhere else, if I went to school anywhere else. I don't think I'd be the same person, let alone be on the path that I'm uh, I'm on now. Because those teachers, the ones that I highlighted, just to name a few, I'm, I'm probably missing some, I'm sure. But they kind of helped traject me into the art world or into the kind of confidence that it needs to dive into such a career, you know? It's, it's, it's funny that you mentioned writing so early on because I think my initial exposure to you was 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 through your visual medium through your through your paintings and yeah. what I what I noticed uh, when, when I do a little bit of my preliminary research I I, I kind of like sneak around Instagram and everything and I noticed that some of your posts have like a very a poetic or a very lyrical uh, tone to them and I wanted to ask if if um, if writing if uh, maybe poetry was one of your other passions Oh, yeah. I'm flattered for the homework, too. I'm flattered that it shows that in the work. Uh, for real, I appreciate that. Because that's something that I feel it wasn't originally a thing for me. It kind of stemmed from, you know, when I started making paintings and selling in galleries or whatever have you, when the kind of when it, it started to pick up, I was kind of just always trying to evolve. I never wanted to be pigeonholed into a certain demographic, into a into a certain audience. Being from Brentwood, we know the narrative, this, you know, stigmatizing sociological narrative that comes with being from Brentwood. There's a lot of push and pull, a lot of good and bad that comes from it. I, you know, as soon as I bring it up, you know, I could have one of two conversations nine times out of 10. Yeah. So I always was very vigilant of how I would be perceived in the public, you know, as a person, let alone as a professional artist, public figure, however you want to call it. So 
X amount of shows in, you know, three, four, maybe three gallery shows in, solo shows in. I'm like, man, like I'm looking for something deeper and and whatever else. And then I kind of noticed that I was getting very tired of of, of preliminary sketches. I'd sketch something out. I'd have this idea for an image I want to project or, or translate onto a bigger canvas. And then this action of almost copying my work of like looking at a small drawing from a notebook or like a piece of scrap paper and trying to translate it almost felt like I was setting myself up for expectations that I didn't want. I wanted to create more authentically. I wanted to, I wanted the canvas, the relationship between the canvas and I be to be for the first time for it to be authentic and new. So to escape that, I said, what other exercises can I try or what other kind of sparring or training processes can I access that might help me get a more authentic first run at a canvas at, a, at an original painting and that's when I, I thought back to uh I thought back to Miss Ambrosia and that writing exercise because I write a lot I, I it's just something I do when I'm stressed or when I have a lot to digest or whatever mentally and that's where those words and those phrases kind of started making sense to me on canvas and I, I heard Diego Cortez uh, said something really cool about Jean-Michel Basquiat in a documentary that I love he said he had this cool way of making text pictorial. And I thought, I thought that was like the coolest thing you could ever say about a painting. So I was like, yeah, that's my ode to Jean-Michel Basquiat. He's one of my idols in the art world. So that's my kind of tip of the cap to him. That's my conversation with him. And that's an exercise that allows me to dive a little bit, of, a little bit deeper into the emotions of my work. And all the text that you see in the paintings I took all of my little brother's like elementary school notebooks when he was learning the alphabet and just to make them visually exciting and childlike, I took his little alphabet and kind of memorized it. And so anytime I'm writing, I'm writing in his handwriting. So it's also a subconscious subliminal ode to him someday. You know, when I got to give this body back and all that's left is the work. I hope he looks back like, oh, that was that was for me, you know, like. <laughs> oh, that's so sweet. And my sister's into poetry, too. My grandfather, God rest his soul, got her into poetry at a young age. So I'd always hear her talking about it and writing in it. I guess I've just always been naturally around it and attracted to it by, by exposure to it. So it, it came pretty easy to me. It's kind of a, a synonymous relationship, for me at least, between and studying people like, you know, James Baldwin and Dr. Martin Luther King, who are very poetic speakers, you know. Michael Jackson's one of my favorite influences, one of my favorite, he is my favorite musician and stuff. So just, I've always been, I've always clung to poetry and lyricism and stuff, being a music head, I guess it's just a synonymous thing, I guess, you know. Do you draw inspiration from your poetry and from your art from the same place? Yeah, I think, and, and like, you know, I don't, you know, I, I tell everybody, I'm just a Michael Jackson head of paint, <laughs> paints pictures, man. Anything um, else is icing on the cake, you know, anything else I can kind of, get credit for or earn credit for I should say on this planet while I'm here is a blessing to me so the you know I don't even go about it it is it is a form of poetry and I understand its relationship to the word and to the work but for me it's just kind of the poetry and stuff it stems from I don't even know if now that I'm talking about it out loud I don't even know if I realize or recognize it as poetry I just think it really made a fluid space for me to create because there's some things that imagery can't say. And it's much more romantic and beautiful to read it, you know? And then when I write these things, that I, I write these things on canvas or whatever, I write them in first person. So when the person reads it, when a person's reading a painting and that, just think about that in itself, reading imagery, is such a romantic thing to say about art. And I think that's what we do when we interpret a painting. So to do it metaphorically, spiritually, and also literally, by reading text off of a canvas, I think is just a very cool thing to experience. And I write it so that when the viewer reads it, they're reading it in their inner monologue in first person. So when I write, I love you, I write, I miss you, I write, I want X, Y, and Z to happen or whatever, they're internalizing it. They're personalizing it without even noticing. You know, it's not Diego wants you to feel this. It's I am this, I feel that. So it's just an easier, it's a quicker, more efficient bridge for the viewer to jump right into the work and, and put themselves in that place. Is there an overriding message that you like to convey with your art? Oh, that's a deep question, man. That's crazy. Um, I, I, think, I think if I ever, I'm big on dichotomy, 
but dichotomy is one of my favorite words. And we romanticize and glorify a lot of the success stories in society, whether it's celebrities, whether it's in music, art, painting, whatever. We tend to really celebrate the success and not the strive to succeed or not the, uh, the path, the ups and downs, right? You hear all those cool, kitschy metaphors and you hear all those, you know, food for thoughts for kids like, oh, you know, life is an up and down thing. We say that, but I don't think we really celebrate that in culture. I don't think we celebrate that in popular culture. So dichotomy, the up and the down, the good and the bad, you know, love and hate, love and loss, I, I should say more importantly, the loss of love, you know, the, the gaining of love, the earning of love, the breaking of trust dichotomy. I hope that whoever looks at my work someday when I'm not around to speak for it, they take that away from me, that I understand the full spectrum of emotions, not just one or one or the other, the full spectrum of, of the human experience, you know? You know, when you say that, I, I look at the the picture you have behind yourself with, with the two oh. figures embracing. And yeah, yeah. I, I, I think it, I, I really just, I see the theme in there is just like the, uh, I, I'm, I'm so bad at enunciating things, but just like the whole, the whole spectrum of life to death about connections and losing those connections yeah, and, yeah. and handling loss. Yeah. Oh, I'm grateful that you see it, man. I'm grateful that the message comes through clear, you know? Uh, so what, what drove you to become an artist? Oh man. Um, I think, I don't know. Everyone always asks if I had like somebody in my family that did it or whatever. It was never really like that. I always had a knack for it. That's for sure. Like I would just, copy cassette boxes of, of Pinocchio and Aladdin. I was raised on Disney movies, on animation and, and old school Akira Toriyama and stuff like that. So I, I always had a desire and a passion for it. But in society, we don't really teach what jobs are available, you know? So it never really kind of translated as anything. When I was a kid, I swore I was going to work for Walt Disney. I thought he was still alive. You know what I'm saying? Like, mm. I didn't realize there was a a whole umbrella of production that is Walt Disney Studios, that is all this and all that, the, the real tangible industry of it all. I didn't really get it until my late years. I was always good at, at art and I was always good at, I had a knack for it. It was always my hobby. And the turning point from like hobby to, oh, this genuinely is who I am. I started doing graffiti when I was like 12, 13 years old. And I kind of just be, being consumed by the culture, the friends, the family aspect to it, like the kind of, and it was the first place I had in my own mind, in my environment that I wasn't copying. I wasn't like tracing or redrawing or, or reimagining a Walt Disney character. It was my own mind activating and making letters and characters and structure and and that was really where I said, oh, man, like, I, I think I might be an artist. Like, I think I might genuinely, I don't, I don't just do it. You know, it's what, it's who I am. So fast forward, I kind of went into high school with that mentality. And again, I'm very grateful for the Brentwood High School and the art department. I was taking AP college courses and all those teachers were just helping me sharpen my blade. By the time it was graduating time, you know, there's not a lot of information, at least at that time for me, that was about how to make it in the industry as an artist. People usually direct you into like what college kid you get into for whatever profession is popping at the time. And at that time it was graphic design. I'm not good with computers. I hate them. You know what I mean? <laughs> so I kind of had this conundrum of like, man, I, I really think I can make art for a living, but the, just the question is how. And Nicole Friends, uh, my teacher at the time, saved my life in a lot of ways. I tell her that to this day. Cause she, you know, she saw my hesitance and my fear of college. I was going to go to FIT and uh, just hearing loans and all these crazy mm. terms was terrifying as a kid. I think it's very, very overzealous and ambitious, borderline naive that uh, in this country to ask a child or anywhere for that matter, but specifically in the U S to ask a 17 year old child, what they're going to do for the next four to six years of their lives, academically, financially, and socially. I think it's a terrifying a naive thing to do so I, I for one was terrified I was like yo I'm not I'm not doing that like I don't think it's for me so my teacher the legend goes she, I remember this she was like look don't tell your mom because she'll kill me <laughs> but like stay home like stay local go to school because it's important to stay active like mentally but like stay home don't don't spend your money on something that you don't think you can accomplish you know if FIT is too much for you like don't do it you don't fall into that pressure and she was very insightful as to inspire me to say like I she's like I, I think you can make it 
selling original artwork, original content. I don't think you have to work for anybody. And she gave me the tools, helped me get into gallery shows at an early age. She would take my work and donate it to, you know, anonymously to charities and stuff. So by the time I graduated high school in 2010, I had a little bit of like leverage and I had a little bit of headway on it as to how, how to go about it. And that was that. I started doing it right out the gate. Do you have a, uh, a piece of art that means the most to you? Whew, a, a, a couple. Yeah. A co- and that's the hard part, too. It was easier to answer that question at first, you know, because at <laughs> first it was such a it was such a new, unfiltered, raw experience. I was like that 19 year old. Oh, my God. Like, you know, just creating arrogantly almost. Right. Like, you know, I was creating from a space that like whatever I had to do to get mine off, like whatever I had to do to speak to my people. And it's not that that hasn't changed. It's just that the influence and the outreach and the communal impact has grown since, which is a blessing. It's not a complaint. It's, it's a wonderful thing. So at first it was really easy to kind of like make five bad paintings and get one good one out of the six, you know, cause nobody was really watching, you know, like it was easy. And, and that blade for me was so dull and so new that now that it's sharp, every piece, I'm, I'm activating the deepest part of my subconscious. I'm, I'm activating the deepest emotions I can offer the public. I'm, and, I'm, and it means a lot to me to do so. I, it's funny, the, you know, I love art. I genuinely wouldn't be able to do anything else in my life. I believe that. But sometimes the industry drives me crazy, you know? Commercial contemporary art to me sometimes is poo-poo. I hate it sometimes. You know what I mean? Like, it drives me crazy that, that you know, we celebrate the wrong things in society sometimes. And I put my foot down early on. Like, I don't want to, I want to be known, of course, for a tangible, credible, you know, career and success and financial status, whatever that, if that all comes, I'm cool. But I just want to be known for making work that touches people, that inspires people, that that talks to the little kid in the room and the 55-year-old in the room. And it talks to some kid from New York and Brooklyn or it talks to some kid in Beijing equally, you know, and efficiently, you know? So when I, when, when I made that choice, Oh man, like every piece means so much. Every piece is a part of me. You know, I, I don't, I don't, I don't make it if I don't feel it. You know, I don't, I don't do it. You know, there's no amount of money in the world that would make me do something I don't believe in. You know. Awesome. Now, I always appreciated like how how proud you are too. So as you say, like represent Brentwood in all of your endeavors, uh, whether it be like receiving an award or hosting a show. Uh, what, what do you think comes to mind when people think of Brentwood and what, and how would you like people to think of Brentwood in response to that? Oh man, it's, it's tough. It's, it's tough. And I don't mean that in the sense of like, I don't mean, I, I don't mean any negative connotation when I say it's tough. I say it's tough because being somebody from there, from the root of there, born, like, you know, raised in it, you know, on the streets playing basketball, with my friends or doing this or that with my friends and, and really being a part of my community, not somebody that just went to Brentwood, because there's two types of people that go to Brentwood, right? Mm. There, there's two types of people that attend any society, you know, or any town, any state, whatever. There's somebody that just goes, that never really lived there. They just went, they moved, whatever have you. And there's somebody like me who is in it, who is it, who, who breathes it, who celebrates it, right? So it's tough because for me, I associate Brentwood with with the wondrous diverse people I had around me, the jokes with my friends and the friends I had that I look up to to this day as big brothers that, you know, helped me get through and you know what I mean? And all those little micro relationships that'll never make the news, that'll never, you know? And then it's tough because the stuff that makes the news is unfortunately pretty crazy. And I'm not saying it's not true. There's been some some trying times in my town and, and it's not something to neglect. It's something to work on and advocate to change. And that's why I say it's tough that like the narrative that comes out of what people think from Brentwood, unfortunately, to X amount of degree is true. I'm not going to sit here and lie to anybody. It's tough out here sometimes. But just because that's true, that doesn't mean the other side of things isn't true. That doesn't mean that there are children growing, laughing, playing, falling in love and becoming contributing members to their society in this in this town as well. And again, maybe that stems back to my my appreciation or my my uh my internal value on the word dichotomy right the good and the bad my best friend Dudley Music who's also a Brentwood graduate he's a musician and him and I do a lot of business together one of his songs is about Brentwood called Be Wood and the and the chorus is a lot of people you know get mad at my hood but you got to take the bad with the good sometimes I get mad at my hood but I got to take the bad with the good 
And that's really what it is. So if I want anybody to hear me and what I have to say about Brentwood, it's it's a really authentic example of the flower that grew from the concrete, you know, like Tupac said, you know, it's we're really living that we're really we're living in that analogy in the sense that we're creating beautiful environments and experiences for our youth. We love our youth in the face of adversity, in the face of in the face of of you know, financial struggle, cultural struggle, sociological struggle, whatever you want to call it, it all kind of trickled down in one way, shape, or form. So with that being said, we're here and we're, we're beautiful, you know? Amen to that. I hear that. Yeah. Now, the Dudley Music, that's a, that's a name I, I, I saw come up, um, again, when I was doing my snooping before. Uh, oh, and, yeah. Uh, so it seems like you, you've done some collaborative work with him in the past. Uh, so is, is he another Brentwood native that... Um... Yeah, yeah. I've known Dudley since second grade, man. Oh. Yeah, it's crazy. So it's funny, too, because, like, you know, I've known him since second grade. We, you know, we were school, school kids. We were school boys together. We went to school you know, we got cool through skateboarding and all that. Shout out to the Brentwood Skate Spot. If you know, you know, <laughs> you know, those days were fun. You know, what you would call it. Um, you know, we all got really cool with skating and through through that culture. And then once we graduated high school, I saw him kind of getting into music and being very, I mean, I watched him teach himself the piano in high school, you know, like he's just musically inclined. He's a genius. And he started putting out music and doing this and that. And I started doing the same thing through art, putting out here and there. And then we kind of just, I, I invited him to, to perform at a solo show I had in the Bronx. And like, I don't, I couldn't have been older than 19. And, uh, and we just, it was such a great chemistry. Our narrative just kind of sold the room, like the room was on fire. And we just, that was it. He grabbed me by the shoulder and said, let's do this forever. I was like, all right, yeah, sure. Like a thousand percent. And our, our relationship is synonymous through, through just as people, and and our artistry too, you know. So, so yeah, he's somebody that that I've worked with a lot, and I will continue to work with. Like, you know, that's my right hand right there for sure. Have you done a lot? Of, have you done anything along the lines of um, like community art projects, either in Brentwood and Long Island? Anything just like? Oh yeah, yeah. I was right before right before I kind of started gaining you know credible notoriety in the art world in the galleries out here, whatever. You know, I was helping paint garbage cans, you know, for the schools. And we did a mural. A friend of mine, Candido Crespo, who's also a Brentwood alumni or CI alumni. Either way, I feel like those neighbors, we brothers in that sense. We brothers, we work it towards the same cause if you come from CI, you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. So with that being said, he put together something in Regis Park with McNair at the park, the little park that's over there. And yeah, we were doing stuff. We were hosting events there. We were hosting, you know, live performances and poet nights and stuff like that. In like 2012, 2011, you know, I've been at it for a long time. I've been at it for quite some time. And, I'm, and again, Broadwood provided me the opportunity and the resources and the community to do it. It's one thing to be able to do it. But if nobody really wants it or, or receives it, you know, it is what it is kind of thing. But Broadwood was always receptive. Broadwood's had my back since day one. So, you know. I really do appreciate your time and sitting down with me and sharing your story with myself and with everyone that will be listening in the future. Uh, Absolutely. Awesome. Awesome. Thank you, man. I appreciate you. Thank you. Take care. Be well. All right. Take it easy. My thanks and gratitude go out again to Diego for sharing his story with me and my podcast listeners. Check our show notes to learn more about Diego's art, or you can follow him on Instagram at DiegoAGC. And thank you, as always, to the Bremen Historical Society for making today's podcast possible. Today's music is brought to you again by Dr. Turtle. Check out his music at freemusicarchive.org.